Um, so I want to say today is kind of like turnabout or backwards day. And I believe that most of us as members of the league haven't had extensive experience with the prosecution side of the justice system. Uh, but, or I hope not, uh, uh, doesn't mean none, but uh, conversely, I want to say Patty Perlow does have extensive experience in her community. She is either on or has been on the Relief Nursery Board, Kids First Board. She belongs to Rotary and she works with the Eugene Coalition Against Sexual Exploitation. In her day job, she has been a prosecutor for over 27 years and has prosecuted the entire range of cases that come before the Lane County District Attorney's Office. She was appointed by Governor Kate Brown in July 2015 and to the position of district attorney and she was elected to, in 2016 to a full term. So thank you for coming today and welcome Patty Perla. Okay. All right. So <laughs> that's probably got an O face. Um, how many of you have heard me speak before? A handful. <laughs> so I guess I'll go back a little bit in time and give you a little bit of information about myself before I get started. The, uh, the topic of my presentation is the evolution of prosecution and that's because the alternative title was going to be the oleo of prosecution because it's such a wide variety of, of uh, areas that I was asked to address. So just a little background about, my, about me. I was born and raised in Oregon, went to the U of O for undergraduate, uh, spent uh, my senior year doing an internship at the legislature. Uh, graduated from the U of O, tried working in downtown Portland in a, a financial firm, and that lasted two months. And then I went back to the legislature, and then I went to law school. And uh, right out of law school, I started clerking for a, a judge, and that lasted for five months before I went <laughs> to the uh, Lane County District Attorney's Office. I was uh, clerking for Kip Leonard at the time, and uh, uh, one of the lawyers in the office, a woman, Karen Tracy, came down and asked if I would be interested in working for the DA's office. And I'd been watching their work for about five months at that point. And uh, I thought, wow, that would be, that would be incredible. Uh, because the lawyers were so professional and the work they did was really of value to the community. They were passionate about the victims that they served. And I went to my interview and walked out of that saying, who would want to work there? <laughs> it was a terrible experience. Fortunately, Doug Harkle Road was the DA at the time, called me back to his office. I met with him and he uh, explained the passion of prosecution. And the, actually the highlight was you get to tr your goal is to do the right thing every day. And that is a reason to get up and go to work for, it's now gonna be, I know that uh, said 26 or 27 years. On January 30th, I've been in the Lane County DA's office 29 years. So that getting up and going to work and being passionate about it because your goal is to do the right thing every day is a reason for my longevity there. Um, but talking about the evolution of prosecution, the DA's office um, has had, uh, in my time there, quite an evolution in women in the office. Uh, when I first started there, it was a real cutthroat atmosphere. Uh, the lawyers uh, sometimes were rooting for other lawyers in the office not to win because they were so competitive with each other which did not seem like the goal you would want to have uh, in a community-based uh, you know, public service function. And so, uh, in fact, I was told women cost the office more uh, because they have babies and uh, have to take some time off to, to uh, recover from that event. Um, to today, it's more than 50% women in the office. We encourage people to be family friendly, uh, both 
mothers and fathers are encouraged to take time off with their with their newborns and their children and we cover for each other if somebody has a sick child uh, be it the mom or the dad you know we have each other's back all the time now and so that has been a real uh, evolution in uh, and I don't get credit for all of that uh, it has been a long time coming to get to where we are but it has definitely been one of my priorities to make sure that we are family friendly. And I have a lot of young people in the office now, so there's a lot of energy and enthusiasm, and so it's still a place that I wanna go every day to work. So that was the first thing I was asked to talk about was uh, you know, being a woman prosecutor in a male field. And there have been some times that people have been very patronizing uh, during the time of my career as I was prosecuting, and even <laughs> during the time when I was running for election, I was at a meeting, a community meeting, which was not the League of Women Voters, it was a, a Kiwanis Club, when a gentleman raised his hand and said he didn't think that I um, seemed tough enough for being the DA. So <laughs> I let him know that while I'm very polite and friendly in good company, that I do have another side to me that I have used to um, my advantage or to the benefit of my cases as I've gone through my career. So no, just because I'm nice right now doesn't mean I'm always nice. Um, and uh, we have seen a lot of change, just not just in prosecution, but in the legal field over the years. I mean, the Lane County bench now is uh, well, it's an odd number, so it's more than 50% women. So there has been a uh, real change in how uh, the legal profession as a whole has evolved over my career. Uh, the next topic was how have federal regulations, uh, you know, coming out of the Department of Education affected the prosecution of sexual assault on campus cases? Well, at this point, I can say they haven't. My office has a grant uh, that helped create a team at the University of Oregon to address sexual assault on campus. So when somebody reports that they have been the victim of a sexual assault, either on campus or as a student, this team is activated. I have a lawyer in my office who's on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to respond uh, to one of these incidents the person who is the victim of the sexual assault actually controls the investigation and what happens. They get to decide, we don't do any interviews immediately, uh, let them take some time if it's, if it's a crisis situation that it is an immediate report, um, make sure that we can collect evidence if they're willing, take them to the hospital and, and let them have a sexual assault exam, uh, explain to them what the choices are that they have on cooperating with the investigation and uh, eventual prosecution, and let them know that there are a lot of circumstances that they're not gonna get the satisfaction of a case going to trial and somebody being prosecuted because of things like delayed reporting and the inability to gather evidence and all. And so the, the new rules about, well, I guess it's not rule, new rules, it's the uh, rescinding of the uh, rules that President Obama put into place about uh, changing the standard to probable cause uh, rather than clear and convincing evidence for the university's investigation into the event. Hasn't had any impact on us. The schools are allowed to continue under whatever policies they had in place. Uh, but there is a likelihood that regulations will be coming out probably in 2019 or 2020 that may very well impact that. But right now we are doing great work and uh, in cooperation with the University of Oregon, uh, able to provide support to the victims of sexual assault and um, most of them do want to cooperate at least with the university proceeding and sometimes what we get to tell them is you get that satisfaction and we're sorry that we can't go forward with a criminal case. The ones that do go forward as criminal cases, um, I gotta tell you, our community 
is not all that supportive. So yeah, we have a lot of women in, in prosecution and on the bench now, but our community as a whole is not very, not very, um, I'm trying to find a nice way to say this. Uh, in, in our sexual assault cases and our domestic violence cases, uh, finding that uh, in DV cases, it's not the state's business about what's happening in the household. On the sexual assault cases that, you know, uh, why was she in that circumstance where this could happen? Uh, and so, as we're getting ready to talk about unanimous juries. I know that that is something that Oregon is held in contempt for, for allowing 10-2 verdicts. I got to tell you, um, while I'm supporting this notion of unanimous verdicts, we are going to see a lot more mistrials in cases that involve domestic violence and sexual assault because you will never find 12 people who are going to find that there was a reason that that case should have gone to court at all. So, um, enough on that. Uh, there was a question about the impact of the Me Too movement on law enforcement. And I think the impact on law enforcement isn't so much on law enforcement other than the willingness of people to come forward and report. And so if there is an impact on law enforcement, it's that they're taking more reports. It's not, um, an impact in the agencies themselves, uh, just like with prosecution and um, and the the bench and and law, uh, the legal profession, our law enforcement agencies are seeing a lot more women coming on to to serve in that capacity, and so uh, I think the Me Too movement has provided a great opportunity for victims of sexual. Uh, incidents in our community to feel safe to come forward and report to law enforcement and report to others if they don't feel safe going to, to law enforcement. Uh, the next topic was prosecutorial discretion. How do we evaluate cases and what kind of cases do we see most? What size of caseload are we seeing? So that's a lot of, of information to, to cover. We do not investigate crime. Um, if you've seen Law and Order, you've got the police officers who investigate the crime and the prosecutors who hold the offenders accountable. And so we do not initiate or investigate. We are simply responding to what law enforcement provides to us in the terms of an investigation. So they go, uh, somebody reports a crime or they conduct a traffic stop or however it is that law enforcement becomes involved they write a report about that incident and then it gets referred to my office. Last year we had over 7,000 of those come into my office. So what does that mean? 7,000, well, we have a population of uh, just under 400,000, about 380 in Lane County. 7,000 criminal cases coming into an office of 24 lawyers who handle criminal cases in Lane County. So all of those cases have to be evaluated to determine whether they're provable. Uh, assess the evidence. Uh, does there need to be further investigation on the case? I am fortunate that uh, because of grant funding, we now have a DUI investigator that just started last, last month. I think uh, August or September, he officially started on a grant from the Oregon Department of Transportation, it's federal money, to do the follow-up on about 500 DUI cases a year. He, uh, because law enforcement, you know, patrol can't go out and do follow-up on those cases. So, and they're not gonna assign a detective to a DUI, a driving under the influence case. Uh, driving under the influence cases have grown much more complicated since I did them in the early 90s. Uh, now, those are some of the most difficult cases to get your evidence in front of the jury. You do all kinds of pretrial motions on that. And with the uh, addition of cannabis 
being legal, we're seeing a high, an, an increase in incidence of people driving under the influence of cannabis, and we have a difficult time proving that because there's no way to quantify what uh, amount of cannabis is in somebody's system. Our state police crime lab doesn't test blood, they only test urine, so we have a grant from the state of Washington to test our blood, and uh, and you can prove that somebody has cannabis in their system, but you have to rely on the police officer's observations and whether there's any video to whether or not the person's under the influence. We have a domestic violence investigator who's grant funded who does the follow-up because patrol is who responds to a domestic violence incident unless there are uh, serious physical injury uh, or death involved in the case, and they don't have time to do follow-up on the case, so we have somebody who uh, follows up with the victim to take photographs days later to show the progression of any injury, to contact other witnesses, neighbors that may have heard something, uh, all of that that uh, would help support uh, a prosecution. We have uh, a chief investigator who does everything else. So uh, unless a detective is assigned, those three people are doing all of the follow-up investigation. How do we evaluate the cases? We have to prove each case beyond a reasonable doubt, and that is the highest burden that, it, that you could have. It's just short of, I was there and saw it. A jury has to find that beyond a reasonable doubt, this person committed that crime. And so the lawyers in the office review the re reports and determine whether or not, based on the evidence they have there, it, are they going to be able to prove it? Uh, and so uh, regardless of the anecdotes about indicting ham sandwiches and all, number one, we don't have time for that. Number two, we don't have any interest in doing that. And number three, I come back to our goal every day is to do the right thing. And so we assess these cases to determine whether there is proof. And to the displeasure of many people in our community, sometimes we have to determine whether the resources we're gonna invest in the case are worthwhile. So some of the low level offenses we just can't take because we don't have the capacity to do all of the cases that happen in this community. What kind of cases we see the most? Well, despite the reports about the opioid epidemic, which is in fact quite bad, in Lane County, methamphetamine is still king. We get about 1,000 uh, drug cases a year uh, related to uh, methamphetamine. Uh, and then uh, opioids, heroin, and all of that is about uh, 300 cases a year. The reason for that is Oftentimes, the people who are, uh, you know, uh, EMTs are called when somebody overdoses on uh, an opioid. They are uh, treated, and then they survive, fortunately, but no criminal case comes from that. Uh, the criminal cases come from investigations by law enforcement, traffic stops, warrant arrests where somebody has drugs in their pocket. Uh, and so, and we have made possession of uh, hard drugs in Oregon, a misdemeanor, and my office, frankly, doesn't have the capacity to prosecute those cases. So uh, we don't actually have a huge number of misdemeanor level cases. Our goal on those cases is to get people out of the system. If they aren't selling drugs, um, and even if they're selling to support their habit, as opposed to somebody who's in a commercial uh, money-making uh, function of, of selling drugs, we try to get them into our treatment court. And our treatment court is a fantastic program. It has evolved, as everything else has, since 1994 to the point, back then it was the low risk offenders that were coming into to what was called drug court. Now it's your high risk, high needs people who are coming in and they are super hard to convince to engage in the program they have lots of relapses during the course of the program, but our graduations are so exciting because the people who have spent at least a year going through program, being told where to live, what to eat, who they can associate with, uh, you gotta show up to group, you gotta show up to treatment, you gotta show up to court, you gotta go get UA'd. The people who successfully complete that are 
completely changed. And one of the most moving moments for me was a, a mom who hadn't seen her son in 15 years showed up to graduation because the family had written him off as, you know, he moved across the country and was living this life that they didn't endorse and he'd been stealing from family and all. So they had all written him off. Well, she showed up to his graduation. We have somebody who graduated who is, uh, well, more than one, who are mentoring other people in that situation. The mentorship program is terrific. And um, if I'm allowed to look at my calendar before I leave and you're interested in going to one of these graduations and, and hearing the change in people's lives, I would encourage you to do that. Next one is, no, it's in early November, and I can give you the date. It's on a Friday at 1.30 in Harris Hall, which is at the courthouse. Uh, after the drug cases, which are the bulk of the cases we see, uh, would be the domestic violence cases. We get about um, 900 of those a year and then would be the DUIs in the 500 range. After that, it spreads out to the balance that adds up to 7,000. We have five lawyers, it used to be only four, who were dealing with the major crimes cases, uh, the most serious uh, assaults, you know, assaults with a weapon, homicides, uh, child sex abuse, child physical abuse. So we have seen an increase in the complexity of those cases, and we've also seen an increase in volume that's required a, a reallocation of resources. So I used to have a chief deputy, which was really helpful, but now he's prosecuting an entire caseload, and I do that job too. Uh, so uh, other than that, we have two general felony property teams who handle all of your uh, burglaries, a lot of the robberies, the Robbery is a big thing in our community, by the way. Uh, car thefts, I'll get to car thefts in a moment. Um, uh, embezzlements, you name it. They, they cover all variety of that and the drug cases. Uh, we have one lawyer who's dedicated to all of our treatment courts. He handles the general treatment court, which is our drug court. Uh, he handles the veterans court, which is another amazing program. Another group of people, very difficult to gain trust and engagement, but once they complete the program, it's terrific. Uh, and then we added mental health court. That was one of my goals when I ran, uh, or well, actually before I ran, when I was appointed, was to get a mental health court in Lane County. And when it first began, we had a terrible time with attendance because if you're mentally ill and you're homeless, you don't show up to court. Well, imagine getting a group of people in our community together to get some resources so that we can get some housing for people so that they can show up to court. We no longer have that failure to appear problem and we just had our first graduation. So things are looking good in many areas. <laughs> um, so the final thing I was asked to talk about, and I don't know how I'm doing for time. I'm doing all right? All right. Was uh, any legislative agenda for uh, the District Attorneys Association. And I mentioned UUV back a moment ago as one of the kinds of cases that our property lawyers prosecute. There was a court of appeals decision a couple of years ago that makes no sense to me, and if you read it, probably wouldn't make sense to you. A guy was uh, caught in a stolen vehicle with the tools for stealing a vehicle and with not a key to the vehicle and said something to the effect of, oh, I got it from Joe. And the Court of Appeals said, well, then you can't prove he stole it or that he knew it was stolen. And so... <laughs> Uh, Portland has had an incredible increase in the number of stolen cars because everybody knows all you have to do is say, I got it from Joe and I didn't know it was stolen. Um, and so we've asked the legislature to um, fix that in the last session. And it was killed on, a, on what's called fiscal because it would cost too much money to prosecute those cases. No, that's not what happened. <laughs> yes, 
Um, and so um, it, it, we prosecuted them. The criminal code in Oregon came into effect in 1972. And I mean, we prosecuted cases before that, but it was actually codified in 1972. Prosecuted them clear up till 2016 and covered that cost. And then all of a sudden, now we can't afford to prosecute those anymore. So we're asking the legislature to take another look at changing that law, because people in Portland are outraged. Their cars are getting stolen all the time and nothing's happening. Uh, the insurance companies are furious because they're having to cover it. And so another thing that we're asking is that when you're considering cost, the fiscal implications, that it not just be a Department of Corrections cost, that you look to the cost of insurance companies and the community as a whole uh, when these things happen. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, we have some uh, uh, policy um, options that we've asked the legislature to consider, or maybe this is coming as a surprise to you because uh, we're just talking about them now. Uh, one is a package of four uh, called Keep, Keep, Kids Safe Act, Keep Kids Safe Act of 2019 uh, regarding the uh, crime of endangering the welfare of a minor includes exposure to unlawful controlled substances. That's not included in it currently. Um, allow an enhancement for cases involving the assault of a toddler. Uh, establish a definition of physical injury that makes sense for children. Children can't tell you that it hurts. Babies can't tell you that it hurts when they're shaken and they don't die, but they survive from it. They can't tell you that that hurt. And so, um, and, and, and they get marks on them and they can't tell you that it hurt. And so for an adult, maybe a bruise wouldn't hurt, but for an infant, uh, what it takes to create that is pretty significant. So there's a, a, a suggestion that a new law, that any condition that would reasonably cause substantial pain uh, to a child uh, be considered instead of trying to make them tell you how bad it hurt. Um, a request that, the, that Oregon mirror the federal law on the distribution of uh, child child pornography during prosecution. Currently, our discovery rules require us to provide the child pornography to the defense attorney, and we don't want to have it either. So this would be that you go to the law enforcement agency that the lawyers would have to see it there to prepare the case so that we don't possess it, we're not disseminating it. Um, Let's see, oh, some things relating to just general maintenance. There's a, been a, a, an issue, you know, a number of our witnesses are not English speaking. And so they require an interpreter in court. And so it's been raised that the interpreter is, use, is whatever the interpreter say, says is hearsay, <laughs> which means that someone who's not English speaking cannot testify in court. Uh, that that one's an easy fix. I at least I hope so. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, a lot of our domestic violence and um, sexual assault, uh, familial sexual assault, uh, or domestic violence sexual assault and physical violence against children and and uh, intimate partners happen in more than one jurisdiction. You know, they live in Eugene for a while and then they move to Sutherland and then they move to Lakeview and then they move somewhere else. And there are incidents that happen in each of those locations. What we're asking is that we can pick one place to try all of those cases if the parties agree to it, if the prosecutors agree to it, so that they don't have to be tried in more than one place. There's a whole bunch of stuff. We, we always have a long list of wants and needs, don't we? <laughs> so I, I'm not gonna go through it. Those are some of the highlights. Um, and so at this point, I would like to entertain questions because I think it's more interesting if we have a conversation than if I just keep talking at you. Okay, well, I can walk around if you'd rather. <laughs> Mm 
So I sent Mr. to turn a list of questions so she... That's why I said it's prosecution oleo. <laughs> How heavily does the prosecution depend upon plea bargains? And are you concerned, given the large number of cases you have, the quality of the investigations that come? So we don't, out of the 7,000 cases we received, we filed 5,500 because they didn't have sufficient evidence. So we are pretty darn confident in the investigations before we'll even make a filing decision. Um, as to plea bargains, it would be a physical impossibility for Lane County Circuit Court and my office to try 100% of the cases. Right now we have 15 judges, two of them are out at juvenile hearing about about 1,000 cases dependency and another 500 or so in delinquency. Uh, and then we have civil cases going on. So there is no way all of our cases would get heard if we didn't have plea bargains. The other thing to consider is, at least in Lane County, we have a practice of making a better offer at the front end before the case goes to grand jury. And so a lot of times people are encouraged to uh, resolve their case quickly so that there aren't greater consequences. That's just a mechanism of being able to um, handle the volume in this county. But the other thing to consider is the quality of um, indigent defense that we have in this county. We are very fortunate to have good lawyers and uh, they have access to unlimited funds for investigation. So. If there is an issue that they want investigated, they investigate the hoo-ha out of it. Um, the uh, indigent defense spending, well, I have been an advocate for, ad for adequate pay for indigent defense lawyers uh, from the beginning of time. Um, and at this point, their budget is very, very, um, a very significant part of state spending because, well, in particular, uh, our Court of Appeals and our Supreme Court has made it clear that there are standards that lawyers can't even anticipate that are going to come in the future that the defense attorneys have to meet. So I am not worried about the plea bargain practice. I am um, the post-conviction things that happen afterward. Um, if you're worried about plea bargaining and somebody has pled guilty and they think they were railroaded, what happens afterward can go on and uh, for eternity for having lawyers appointed for them to go back and look at the case. Hi, um, you said that there were 1,300 approximately drug-related cases. Um, does that include cases that are, you know, based on drug addicts, you know, robbing houses or murder or whatever under those circumstances, or is that just strictly the people who are found with drugs? That is strictly the people who are possessing or delivering drugs. So the robbery cases and all are handled, um, are calculated uh, as robbery cases. Uh, we take the lead charge to determine what uh, to categorize these cases. Do you have any statistics on what percentage of them are actually drug related? I don't have statistics on that. Not, I mean, in not every case somebody's going to possess drugs and in not every case we're going to know why somebody committed a robbery. Um, I can tell you that we have a number of robbery cases related to uh, marijuana grows, to uh, pharmacies, um, and I would suggest that all of them in the pharmacies are related to drug use. Well, this is a table for questions, isn't it? <laughs> um, I want you to talk a little bit further about something you said earlier. When there are um, non-English speaking uh, people that you're either prosecuting or defending, that they have had interpreters, but those interpreters, if I heard you right, are being um, uh, deemed uh, hearsay in the conversation, so they're not being represented. How do you handle all of that then, if that's the case? 
Did you say that you're trying to get something passed so that the interpreters are not hearsay? Yes. As if it is a court certified interpreter who is reporting what somebody is actually saying, it should not be hearsay. It's just, I tell you, I'm sorry, our Court of Appeals is a little bit uh, um, unusual in some of the decision making that they're making these days. And so you're going to be seeing a lot of things go before the legislature trying to overcome what's coming out of the Court of Appeals. A uh, question here. Um, many years ago, I know the district attorney's office had a really good um, reputation for helping to enforce child support orders. Is that still something that you work on? <laughs> you are talking about one of my favorite things. So our support enforcement division is, can I say kick ass? Um, they have uh, collected between 20 and 22 million dollars a year for Lane County kids. We have an investigator there now who is uh, the Energizer Bunny is the most apt description for him. He has made uh, over a hundred warrant arrests in the last three years for people who have failed to pay their child support. And you'd be surprised how eager people are to pay their child support when they're in jail. Um, it's it, suddenly the money appears and so these are our kids in this community who are uh, not getting the support that the court has ordered for them and when people have children they have an obligation to support them regardless of whether you like each other um, and so um, I am very proud of my support enforcement division and the state has bought new software. So we've been in the last about 10 months of this year going through beta testing and, and now they're doing pilot projects. And so it's been a real challenging, or should I say those are opportunities um, this year for my staff because there have been so many problems with uh, getting the switch over to this new system. And despite all of that, their collections are gonna be the same this year. <laughs> Um, uh, for 38 years in child welfare, and I was very interested in what you said about the pain level of uh, abuse uh, on small children and their inability to talk. Can you expand on that a little bit? And uh, in, in general, what kind of overall support do you think that you might have for that? Um, well, I'm hoping that that makes sense to everyone that children are not able to articulate pain. I mean, particularly under the age of five, they aren't able to articulate it. And between five and eight, they probably can articulate it for a very brief period of time, but they're not gonna be able to articulate it by the time a case goes to trial, which is why we have. Another thing about, that I'm very passionate about in our community, it's kids first. It's the child advocacy, Child Advocacy Center, formerly the Child Abuse Intervention Center for Lane County. Kids who have been physically or sexually abused or who have witnessed uh, violence in their home have a safe place to go where they are greeted. They can have a physical exam by a doctor. They can have a forensic interview by somebody who's uh, nationally training other people. Uh, and they have advocacy there. They have, uh, we hold grand jury for the children there so that they don't have to go to the courthouse and have seven people looking down on them um, while they tell what happened to them uh, in a room that's not ADA accessible, by the way. Uh, and so our response to what happens to children in this community is terrific. Um, and DHS is, uh, somebody who is a partner of Kids First and does a lot of the interviews there when it's a family member that's involved in the abuse. Um, but to say that um, it's not physical injury because the child can't say how bad it hurt um, when the injury is um, you know, bruising as opposed to a broken bone or um, some, you know, it's just something that if, you, if an adult could articulate that it hurt really bad, it would be a crime. But because a child can't say that, 
doesn't have the words for it or is asked too late uh, about it, that then it's not a crime. Hi, Patty. <clears throat> There's a connection between animal abuse and other sorts of criminal behavior. Could you talk for a minute about whether you um, are referred any animal abuse cases, whether you prosecute them, and whether there's any treatment available so that someone who has been found uh, as abusing animals uh, can get the help so that they're not likely going to be involved in domestic violence or other sorts of assault cases uh, uh, with humans in the future? There is a direct connection between uh, abusing animals and abusing people. And uh, children who are involved in abusing animals are treated very differently than adults are because our juvenile justice system is meant to help people uh, recover from things, um, to remediate as opposed to punish, unless punishment is the only thing that's left available to do. Uh, so um, on the Kids First board is the uh, owner of the emergency veterinary hospital so that there is a, a person who is able to uh, connect the communities, the, all of the people who are partners who meet on our multidisciplinary team, uh, law enforcement, uh, DHS child welfare, uh, schools, uh, to watch for these events and to be able to uh, have an authority in the room, uh, in the, uh, an expert on that subject, get the information out to all of these partners to be looking for uh, acts of uh, abuse against animals and then um, address it right away. And I can tell you that hindsight's 2020. We see in all kinds of very, very serious cases down the line that there were early incidents of abusing animals. And in our domestic violence cases, that is a mechanism of, of control, is threatening um, the, the animal that the family member or the intimate partner or a child loves. Um, I did prosecute a case where a man killed a woman's chickens because uh, he, that was part of his mechanism of control. Um, so yeah, there is a huge connection and it, it's great if we can find it early while the person is in childhood as opposed to looking back after the fact and saying, oh yeah, there were all these signs that nobody did anything about and look where we are now. I have a question. I know the DEA, I believe, has somewhat direct uh, relationship with the juvenile department. Could you expand upon that? How one of the judges, the circuit court judges, I think is also the judge in the juvenile court. So how, how do you relate with uh, the juvenile program and kids who are 16, 17, what happens? All right, well, that's a lot of subjects. So at juvenile, uh, at juvenile court, there is dependency, which is are you removing children from the home because the parents can't adequately care for them or have abused them or there's some other thing. And then there's delinquency, which is children engaging in acts that if they were an adult would be a crime. My office used to do both. But uh, the Department of Justice, um, we got in a, in a fight with DHS, and DHS said they didn't want us uh, coming in on those cases anymore, even though the statute says that the DEA uh, is a party in those cases. DOJ came in and billed over a million dollars for work that we did for $88,000. Um, but that includes work beyond what we did. So. I, but anyway, uh, so we don't have anything to do with dependency anymore. Delinquency, uh, I have one lawyer assigned and there's one judge assigned to, to uh, a half-time docket of delinquency and then there's a judge and a half that does dependency work because the volume is so high. Uh, our involvement is uh, law enforcement refers cases over just like they do in the adult cases. They get reviewed. But in juvenile, um, there's uh, our Department of Youth Services has an intake unit. So they get the reports first. 
and they try to determine if there is some other way that the case can be re resolved by a formal accountability agreement, which means the family all agrees to engage in services, uh, maybe perform some community service, maybe go to the teen rap court, which is a peer court. There are different things that happen before a determination is made that it's gonna get referred to my office. Now, if the case gets referred to my office, um, then a charging decision is made just as we would in adult court. But in juvenile court, they staff everything. Um, it, it's alarming the number of uh, sex cases that come into juvenile, young people who are committing sex crimes. And so there's an entire team and unit that meets to try to figure out how to address the needs of the victim and the child, uh, particularly if they live in the same household. And then, um, Ultimately, if the crime is really, really bad and the history is really bad and there are no resources available and the person gets sent off to the uh, deten state detention system. But we Hello. do try for a really long time. <laughs> Hello. Um, um, my nephew volunteers for a medi free medical for the poverty-stricken people thing, and he runs into a lot of... PTSD or not, veterans, uh, and there was one case which, highlighting the question she raised about uh, uh, plea bargaining, uh, the he was involved in a messy divorce and he'd already remarried and had an infant child, uh, and uh, threats were made by the prosecutors apparently uh, that coerced him into plea bargaining to. Uh, and this is a, like a direct quote from the little kid who was inveigled by the mom, the, the, the ex-wife, to win the custody case. She would have exclusive custody if she did this. Um, and, and she was accusing him of uh, 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 grabbing the kid with his prehensile robotic arm, which he didn't have, but which the kid had seen on a cartoon. Um, and then after the after they coerced him into plea bargaining so his new wife and kid would not be thrown out in the street. Um, now he's gonna do five years in, in prison. Uh, is there any kind of, uh, I like with medical malpractice, is there any kind of authority that looks into the cases where the lawyers afterwards say to the, to the uh, court appointed attorney that was on his side, uh, yeah, we know the, the person is completely innocent, but it's a score. Okay. We added to our score. <laughs> so oh, yeah. there are no scores kept in the DA's office, I can assure you. Um, and I, I want you to think about this for a moment, that you are hearing one side of this from somebody who has a vested interest in the outcome. So I cannot tell you the number of times that we have had children in court testifying about sexual abuse and there is the child and maybe one family member and there will be 30 or 50 people uh, sitting in the audience of, uh, on the other side in support of the person who's been charged of, with the crime uh, because nobody can believe that somebody they know could commit an act like that. And nobody wants to believe that anyone they know could commit an act like that. But I can assure you that the facts that you're reciting to me are not completely accurate. <laughs> the plea bargaining thing is something, something that happens. Um, Well, that's the judge's role. I mean, if there are defenses to a case, the defendant is asked at the time of pleading guilty whether or not they are guilty of the crime that's charged. And if a defendant says, no, I'm not guilty of that crime, there's no plea bargain. They aren't allowed to enter a guilty plea. I have a question for you. Um, an 85-year-old friend of mine was recently the victim of uh, elder abuse and assault, and she was very complimentary of the police and the officers who interviewed her. She was laudatory of the prosecutor who 
is taking her case, what totally, totally unnerved her was appearing before the grand jury and having those seven people sitting up above staring down at her. And I wonder if there's a way to make the grand jury process more collegial or less intimidating for victims. Well, grand jury is a function of the court and we appear there, but we do not get to control how it's set up or designed other than the fact that the court has given us authority to move the child abuse cases to a different location. But I can tell you if we have a vulnerable victim and somebody who uh, has infirmities or concerns uh, about that, some communication with the, lawyer, the prosecutor handling the case, we might be able to move that case over to the Child Advocacy Center just to um, reduce some of the, the level of trauma. We can't do that in every case, but uh, certainly if there's a vulnerable victim, an elderly victim, that's something we would consider. And in fact, we use the Child Advocacy Center in a number of circumstances to interview people who have uh, uh, developmental disabilities or uh, communication uh, issues just to try to reduce the level of trauma that somebody suffers when they're already suffering coming into the criminal justice system. Yes. Oh, and we're trying to get a new courthouse, and so I will be sure to tell them if we get a new courthouse that we need a grand jury room that's not only uh, ADA accessible, which ours is not, um, that uh, it would be nice if it wasn't so we're looking down on you. Because it really is. That's what it is. They're sitting up above looking down on you. Um, I, two things, and they were sort of in response to what other people were asking and you were saying. One was in response to this man back here that, um, that also the state can come to people, you know, and that, that maybe the, well, the state can come to people and say, we believe that something happened, but we don't have the funds to, there's so many other cases out there that the victim doesn't have the support. We see that victim has the support. So you need to follow through to support the victim in these ways, counseling and so on. And if you don't, then the state can come back and reassess whether, you know. So the victim, I guess what I'm saying, he was saying that the, um, from, from the perpetrators, you know, that, that um, to give them the benefit of the doubt. But, but the victim can also receive um, instruction from the state. I don't know if that's true here in Oregon, but, but I guess my question would be, if there is a victim and you think that, that something happened, but do you, do you, if you believe there's a case, do you go ahead and investigate that or do you have a response like, uh, we don't have the funds, this, there's a support for this victim, and so you need to do these things in order to make sure that they get the support they need. And if you don't, then we'll come back and, and maybe they'll need to go somewhere else. I, I don't know, would that ever be something that would happen? Well, it's not supposed to. We have a state law that says if somebody reports an incident of abuse or neglect that it get investigated by DHS Child Welfare and be cross, and if there's a crime involved, cross-reported to law enforcement. And so they're supposed to all be investigated. I know because of workload, sometimes the time, timeliness of that isn't as good as it should be and they're doing some triaging, but in every case there should be a, an investigation um, on the child abuse and neglect cases those kids are all interviewed we had uh, over 800 kids 800 Lane County kids forensically interviewed at Kids First last year and that's another thing um, the child's statement uh, depending on their age and all it, it's a person who is completely trained and certified to not ask leading questions, but to ask questions in an age-appropriate way to try to determine what, if anything, happened. And if the child can't articulate the case and there isn't any other evidence, it's not going forward. And just the other question was, um, with people who speak different languages and interpreters, that, that I was just curious, are deaf um, interpreters also considered in that um, as, as that their interpretation would be hearsay? I can't imagine that it wouldn't be. Okay. Because it's somebody else reporting what the witness is saying. Um, 
and that, yeah. Thank you. Thank all you right. very much. Thank you. Thank you all for having me.